It's always a brighter day with the Lord, with the Lord, with the Lord. He is the one who says, let there be light. And there is light. He's a way maker, a way maker. Amen. When we don't see the way, and we don't know how he's going to do it. When we think uh, that the bottom's going to fall out, and I don't know, maybe sometimes the bottom does fall out. But that doesn't hinder God, doesn't hinder the Lord. Uh, when, when we find ourselves falling, there is uh, that uh, presence of the Lord, uh, holy hands and powerful hands to catch us to hold us, to embrace us, uh, they will get better. Things will get better. Amen. Amen. Thank the Lord. Don't ever give up just because of the way things may seem. The way things may seem. Remember when Jesus was on the cross, he asked the Father, why have you forsaken me? Uh, but yet again, he turned around and said, into your hands I commit my spirit. It wasn't that God had forsaken him. It was just that he felt that way. He felt that God had forsaken him. Sometimes we feel that way. But the reality of it is that the Lord is there. He's always there. And uh, things will get better. Uh, church, they do get better uh, because of the Lord, because of the Lord, because of the Lord. Thank the Lord, thank the Lord. Amen, amen. Turn with us to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 24. And as we continue now, after having celebrated on last week the resurrection of our Lord and uh, with the few thoughts that uh, were encompassed in the resurrection of the Lord. Let us look further here. Luke 24, beginning with verse 44, and we shall read through verse 49. And they read as follows. Then he said, this is Jesus, said to them, his disciples and believers, these are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. And he opened their understanding that they might comprehend the scriptures. And then he said to them, thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And you are witnesses of these things. Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. The theme is still the cross. The subject for today is Jesus is coming again. Jesus is coming again. Jesus, in this particular passage, uh, it relates to us and compares beautifully uh, with the other gospel writers, uh, but this just being one of the incidents uh, that occurred. Jesus, after the resurrection, he remained on earth for 40 days uh, before his ascension into heaven. Jesus spent this time this 40-day period with his disciples, and he spent this time with other believers. Uh, they were still dealing with his death, 
and resurrection and wondering about the future. Uh, now that Jesus has died and the trauma uh, of that and the effects uh, that had accompanied his death and the cruel manner in which Jesus had given his life, but uh, to rejoice on the day of the resurrection, uh, this time period was necessary for Jesus uh, to spend now with the disciples before he ascended into heaven because uh, they needed more clarity on uh, what to do uh, now. What, what's going to take place now? What is going to happen uh, now that uh, our Lord is back again? Well, we find in verses 44 and uh, 45, then he said to them, these are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me, he is saying. And verse 45 says, And he opened their understanding that they might comprehend the scriptures. Jesus now, uh, during this time period, used it in which he reminded the disciples and the other believers uh, of words that he had already taught them. He reminded them of it. Uh, words that were written in the Old Testament. There was only Bible that they had then, of course, was the Old Testament. And he reminded them of uh, what the Old Testament teachings were concerning himself, concerning him. He says in verse 44 that all things must be fulfilled, must be fulfilled. Things that related to the cross and the most recent events that had occurred uh, that we've touched on and, and will a little bit more. The recent events of the crucifixion and of course uh, his, his coming back to life. But he also related to them future events, things that were going to come, things that would happen uh, from that point. Jesus taught now the Old Testament scriptures, opening their understanding, verse 45 says, regarding the cross and the crucifixion and uh, the cross and his resurrection. He opened their understanding. I don't know how many passages we don't have of which Jesus related to the disciples and others regarding now of what he is saying here. Going back to the Old Testament uh, book of Moses, the word says that uh, he, he told them things that uh, were to be fulfilled that were written in the law of Moses, the first five books of the Old Testament uh, were written by Moses. In those books, there were things that were said regarding Jesus and the cross, uh, the crucifixion, and the resurrection. We can just look in the book of Genesis itself. We can regard uh, in the passage of which uh, Moses wrote uh, concerning Jesus. Jesus' name was not mentioned, but he was referred to there in the opening passages of the book of Genesis after Adam and Eve had fallen and had to be addressed and confronted uh, by God. And when God confronted them along with the serpent, and of course that was Satan, uh, he said that, he would put enmity, division, separation between the seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman. The seed of the woman, God was referring to the coming deliverer. Though that would be a few thousand years later, 
uh, God uh, had already given that promise and that prophecy. He said that the seed of the serpent, our serpent himself, would bruise the heel of the seed of the woman, but the seed, the deliverer that would come from the woman would step on the head of the serpent. Uh, that is the opening gospel that we have in the book of Genesis. It may be that uh, the Lord taught them even that particular passage. It said that he spoke to them words that were written in the Psalms and in the prophets concerning himself, uh, of uh, his death, the crucifixion, and uh, the resurrection. We find in Psalm 16, we find in other passages of uh, the Psalms in which uh, the word is spoken that a body God has prepared for me, and that is referring to Jesus. In Psalm uh, 72, it talks about uh, the Lord not allowing uh, 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 the body of his servant to see corruption. That's referring to the resurrection of the Savior that was to come. We find in the book of Isaiah so many. That's one of the old prophets. It could be that the Lord referred to the book of Isaiah. Isaiah is just, is just well, the term I want to use is just pregnant with the words talking about Jesus, of his crucifixion, and also his resurrection. We find in the ninth chapter of Isaiah, also in the 53rd chapter of Isaiah, it talks about Jesus' birth. It talks about uh, uh, Jesus' death. It talks about Jesus coming back to life. You can look in the book of Isaiah, and just in those two chapters alone, in Isaiah, the ninth chapter, and about the first seven verses, and all of the 53rd uh, chapter of the book of Isaiah, you can see the words of which you can say, uh, Merry Christmas. You can see the words that would help you to say Good Friday and the words that would help you to say thank you for uh, the resurrection Sunday. All of that just being involved. Uh, and that's throughout the words of the Old Testament. This is what Jesus, I'm sure, was referring to. The Old Testament opening their understanding regarding the cross and the crucifixion regarding the cross and the resurrection. But I don't want you to miss the other thought that is coming to us from Jesus now in speaking with his disciples. Jesus taught the Old Testament scriptures, opening the understanding of those during these 40 days regarding the cross and the fact that Jesus is coming again that he's coming again. Well, we find again in verse 46, he says, thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. Verse 47 starts with that conjunction, the word and, and. Jesus is completing his thought now from verse 46. The Old Testament teaching that Christ would suffer, be crucified, rise on the third day, and that repentance and uh, remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. And you are witnesses, he says, of these things. Behold, in verse 49, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem, until you are endued with power from on high. It is at this time, remember, Jesus is reminding them of what was in the Old Testament regarding the fact that he's coming again. This is included that they were to uh, preach and teach and live lives reflective of the fact that they served a risen Savior and that life 
wasn't over. The scriptures were not finished. God's plan had not been completed and is not completed yet. It's not completed yet. This is what Jesus is saying. So don't miss that point in verse 47 that Jesus is coming again, that he's coming again. He wanted them to know and to understand and to appreciate this. This is associated also with the cross that Jesus is coming again. Oh, remember in the 14th chapter of the Gospel of John when Jesus had completed the observance of the Lord's Supper with the disciples and when Judas had gone out uh, 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 to, to, to get those who would betray Jesus, Jesus was on his way to the Garden of Gethsemane uh, where he would be praying and he knew that that's where he would be arrested and ultimately taken to trial and crucified. But on the way to the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus was talking about with his disciples uh, uh, his death, wanting to help them in dealing with the grief that uh, they were beginning now to encounter, to understand a little bit more that Jesus had just said in uh, observing the Lord's Supper, this is my body which is broken for you. This cup that you drink from uh, possesses the New Testament of my blood which is shed for the remission of sin. He is saying uh, to them, uh, uh, young fellas, I'm going to the cross and I'm going to die for the sins of the world. As some of that began to sink in, the cross, Jesus was explaining a little bit more. In the 14th chapter of the Gospel of John, he said, now let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. For in my Father's house are many mansions. He said, if it were not so, I would have told you. I'm not going to mislead you, he said. If it was not so, I would have told you. And I go to prepare a place for you that where I am, there you may be also. I'm coming again, I'm coming again, he said, to receive you yes. unto myself, that where I am, there you also may be. He was talking about the cross, but it was also letting them know that the cross is teaching the fact that I am coming again. So in verse 47, it says Jesus is adding to what the Old Testament has said about the crucifixion, the resurrection. Now he's saying the cross is also teaching of my coming again. He said uh, to them, and it's what we are to do, verse 47, that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name, in Jesus' name, to all nations beginning in Jerusalem. He said that uh, they were as we are to preach repentance and remission of sins because it's all made possible by the cross. And uh, it helps us to understand that Jesus is coming again. Let us look at a uh, few passages here. Uh, in Genesis, uh, the 12th chapter, and in uh, the third verse, uh, this is another teaching from the Old Testament in Genesis. This is when the Lord had called uh, uh, Abram to go out from his people and out of the family of Abram, of which, who was ultimately Abraham, the Savior would come. Jesus said, I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. He is saying when the Lord, when the Savior comes again, all the families of the earth will be blessed. That salvation is open for everybody. It wasn't just for the Jews. It's not just for us. It's for every nation. And the time will come when all nations, the families of the earth, will recognize 
Jesus as Lord. In Psalm 110 and the first verse, the Lord said to my Lord, this is one of the Psalms uh, that helps us understand the fact of Jesus' death, his uh, uh, resurrection, and uh, the fact that he's coming again. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. There's coming the day when the enemies of God will be the footstool of our Lord. That's when Jesus will be coming again. In Isaiah chapter 45, verses 22 through 25, he says, Look to me and be saved, all you ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. I have sworn by myself, the word has gone out of my mouth in righteousness and shall not return, that to me every knee should bow, every tongue shall take an oath. Now, that's in Isaiah, in the Old Testament, but as Jesus was opening the understanding of the disciples, ultimately, they picked up on what he was saying, that he's coming again. Just that verse uh, uh, here in verse 23, that to me every knee shall bow, every tongue shall take an oath. You're going to find the apostle Paul in the New Testament in the second chapter of Philippians and the 10th verse, he's quoting what Isaiah said in the Old Testament about Jesus coming again, where he said that every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God. Verse 24, he shall say, Surely in the Lord I have righteousness and strength. To him men shall come, and all shall be ashamed who are incensed against him. In the Lord all the descendants of Israel shall be justified and shall glory. The descendants of Israel, that doesn't mean now just Jewish people who believe in the Lord. He's talking about all believers. That's who the real Israel is all believers, the new church that we are to be a part of. So Jesus was sharing in the writings, just, these just a few verses in the Old Testament that refer to the fact that he's coming again. So Jesus said, we are to preach repentance, still preach repentance, and remission of sin. Some folk don't even want to preach rem uh, 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 repentance anymore. They just want to preach remission of sins. That when Jesus died, sins were washed away. But church, that doesn't mean we become perfect when we accept Jesus. We still got to bow before him. We still have to grow. We still have to learn. We still have to repent of sin for other things to be washed away. Oh, we do that until Jesus comes. He also says now that in verses 48 through 49, and you are witnesses of these things. Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. What Jesus is saying here, not only are we to preach repentance and the remission of sins till he comes, we are to live holy lives, and we are to live empowered lives. That being witnesses, that's what causes us to be witnesses now until Jesus comes. All of this is made possible by the cross because Jesus is coming again. Let us look at uh, some verses now in the New Testament. Since we are to preach repentance and remission of sins, since we are to live holy and empowered lives uh, by the coming of the Holy Spirit, Jesus is talking about, we are to receive the Holy Spirit. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18, but the message of the cross, that's what we'll be preaching to others, 
The message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Oh, that's why we have to preach it, teach it, live it, share it, because it's of the cross. That's what we stand for. It's foolishness. You're going to get beat up sometimes when you preach the cross. You're going to get talked about when you mention the cross. When you talk about Jesus coming again, somebody's not going to like it. To those who are perishing, it's foolishness. But to us who are being saved, it's the power of God. Now, look at that, being saved. That, that is to help remind us that there's still some work that God is doing with us. God is still smoothing out the rough places. He's still cleansing some unclean spots. Oh, we're being saved still. It is God's power that is doing it. That's what we are to stand for because he's coming again. In Acts chapter 1, verses 9 through 11, further of Luke's writing, Luke wrote the book of Acts, and that's after the Gospel of John, talking about Jesus coming again. Now when he, Jesus, had spoken these things to his disciples, while they watched, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. The book of Hebrews tells us, And as it is appointed for men to die once, but after this the judgment, so Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. To those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time apart from sin. He's not coming to die for sin anymore, but for salvation. As the disciples saw Jesus go up, they received the word that he's coming back again. Oh, I can imagine that was a beautiful sight, an awesome vision. It was something that, that uh, struck their hearts and their minds. They were amazed as Jesus went up, but the angel told them, now don't waste any time just standing here. And we can't waste time now, church, uh, uh, because the Lord is coming again. Right. The angels told them, don't just stand here gazing up into heaven. Uh, he's gone now. Uh, uh, his spirit uh, is coming to be with you, but don't waste your time just looking at the clouds. Uh, uh, he is coming back. He's coming back. You get out and you do the work that he has told you to do, and that is to preach repentance and the remission of sins. Preach the fact that Jesus is coming again. Live for him, knowing that he's coming again. Church, we learn from these passages and so many others, again, what uh, the resurrection teaches us, that he's coming again. And so we have to remember that because Jesus rose, that we're going to rise. And that helps remind us that he's coming again. Right. We'll be raised from the dead ourselves one day, and we'll be judged on how we've lived. We'll be judged on how we have used the gifts that the Lord has given unto us. Paul says in Romans 14 and 12, each of us shall give account of himself before the Lord unto God. Jesus says in the fifth chapter of the Gospel of John, verses 26 through 29, 
that uh, everybody is going to rise from the grave. Uh, but some will rise to the resurrection of life, eternal life. Some will rise to the resurrection of condemnation. That means that some will receive uh, the judgment of going to heaven and others will receive the unfortunate judgment of going to hell. It all depends on how we live, how we use the gifts God has given us during our time of life, waiting, living for Jesus' return. Our judgment will be that which is suited for how we've lived, for how we've obeyed, for how we indeed have followed Christ Jesus. Use the gifts God's given you. We're to be spokespersons for him, messengers for the Lord. We're to live for him. Let our gifts, God's given everybody gifts, given everybody talents, Use them for the glory of God. When he comes again, that's what we must answer to. How we've lived. How we've used the gifts. For good or for evil. So let us proclaim the word. Let us live knowing that he's coming again. And be ready for him to come. This is our time. This is our opportunity. Don't waste it. Don't throw it away. Don't, don't discard it. Don't forget about it. Live for the Lord. For church, he is coming again. Folks didn't believe it when he came the first time. Some don't believe it. Uh, even now that he's coming a second time. He did come the first time he is coming again. We extend an invitation now to Christian discipleship. If there is anyone desiring to come to the Lord, to give him your life, uh, to repent, to turn from sin, seeking the Savior, uh, letting, letting uh, the Lord know uh, that you are repenting, that you're sorrowful, God is sorrowful for sins, that you want to be cleansed, you want to change, you want to turn, give your life to him. The Lord, knowing your heart, does forgive. He does receive, and he will receive you into his sheepfold. Let the Lord know and let the church know. That's what uniting with the church is all about, that you're letting the public know that you're giving your life to the Lord. And when you do so, it is the Lord who will use you for his honor and his glory. If you're here desiring prayer, whatever your needs may be, won't you come? While the choir sings, let us stand. Whosoever will, let him come, let him come. Whoever you are, you don't have to wait for somebody else. If you feel within yourself the need to come forward, won't you come unto the Lord? The blood that Jesus shed for me way back on Calvary, the 